on Rangatira Island in the Chathams and I've come to help doc scientists Graham Taylor and other experts with their studies on broadbill primes and sooty shearwaters. We're just heading out to Graham's study site, putting on our petrol boards, these giant boards that make walking through the forest really difficult, but we've got to wear them because otherwise we'd squash too many burrows. At the moment we're out here on Rangatira Island as part of my seabird hat and we're obviously wearing a cap with a seabird on it so it's appropriate. Um, this cluster of burrows we've got around us here are sooty shearwater burrows and these burrows in particular are special because we have got birds tagged in them with little tracking devices called geolocators which were put on a year ago and we're hoping with these when we recover the birds to look at their annual movements to see where they've been um, right throughout the breeding cycle and in the post-breeding molt period when they fly to the North Pacific. Yeah, the sooty shearwater has one of the longest um, migrations of any species on the planet. They can not only fly massive distances, but they're also one of the deepest diving birds. They're known to dive down to 60 to 90 metres under the water. They feed out in very cold water during the summer, down at the polar front, in water that's uh, 3 to 4 degrees and then they fly back up here to the Chatham Islands, back to these burrows to feed their chicks and change over shifts with their partners. As they can fly back rapidly from maybe a couple of thousand kilometres south of here back to the burrow within less than a day to carry on doing um, feeding chicks and stuff like that. The sooty shearwaters are a really good sentinel species for climate change um, because they feed in both the North Pacific and the South Pacific and they cover such a really big part of the southern, I mean of the whole Pacific Basin. Um, their changes in behaviour and what they're doing will be, give us quite an early warning of the impacts of you know, global changes in the marine environment. Um, particularly things we're looking at is um, changes in the shift lengths of birds, how long it takes them to find food while they're incubating their eggs, um, things like how long it takes them to find food for their chicks. If the food supplies are scarce, then they're going to have to take a lot longer at sea to locate food. And so these little tracking devices have got activity recorders on them that will tell us how long they've been away from the nest and whether or not they're successfully fledging chicks in the season. What are you going off to do? Get some sooties. Um, try and find some sooty shearwaters. Graham's at it again, trying to find a teddy with a geolocator on. He's only got five out of the 16 he needs. We've got 11 more to get and only six days to go. Day after day and night after night, Graham's clattering through the forest on his petrol boards, trying to find a teddy with a geolocator on. A teddy! But no, it doesn't have a geolocator. Plenty of times Graham reaches into a burrow and pulls out the wrong species. A grumpy penguin. Not what he wants right now. Um, happy blue penguin. <laughs> More often than not, he reaches into the burrows only to find nothing and he comes back empty handed. James and the other Graham working on broadbill pirates were pulling out bird after bird with geolocators on. We're getting tired and we've only got three more days to go and still no more geolocators. We're going to have to change tactics. The other Graham had spotted a Titi takeoff point. He'd seen more than 200 birds take off from this site between 5.30 and 6.30 in the morning. It was close to one of Graham's study site, high up here on this cliff. What's more, some of them had been marked with white paint. That way we knew for sure that they'd been coming from Graham's study site. So we hatched a new plan. Here we are gobbling breakfast before we're racing out to go and find these sooty shearwaters as they take off above this cliff. It's half past four. It's half past four <laughs> and we've got to fling ourselves on top of these sooty shearwaters before they take off. Poised with our nets we lay in wait, waiting for the first of the teddy to start streaming past. It was dark and it was hard to see but if we saw a flash of silver on their legs, down with the net, and we'd try to catch the titi as they started to stream past. Then they began racing, and we had to work fast to try and catch the birds. Eyes peeled and hearts racing, we waited for the right bird to come by.
finally we were able to net one. We had our bird with a geolocator and Graham would be very happy. It was in the bag. One precious cargo. This tag will have been all the way to the North Pacific and back. Back at the hut, James and Graham hook up the data logger. Do you want to receive the data? Yes, please. So does it suddenly start to spew data? Will do. Yeah. So what's that data telling us? At this stage, you have to run it for a program to decode it. Back on the mainland, Graham will be able to decode this data and make a map like this one. It'll tell us where this bird's been. He's already found that some of the birds from Rangatira Island go up off the coast of Japan and others up to the California current off the coast of Los Angeles. It is here that there's been a massive decline in the world's population of titi since the 1990s. Sooties have been um, declining in the California current since at least the 1990s and there's been a lot of work done by the Americans to try and understand what's happening in that area. They're talking about something like a 90% decline in numbers have occurred in the California current. Um, the population in New Zealand has halved since the 1970s, so even though it's still a fairly common bird with millions of them, there's you know, half as many birds as there was back in the 1970s. This last season was an extremely poor, poor season for city shareholders. There was hardly any chicks reared, and we don't know if this is just a, a one-off glitch here, you know, the food supplies failed and they weren't enough food for the chicks to be fed, or whether it's you know, a series of poor years start to develop, that's when we start to wonder whether long-term climate change is impacting on our seabirds. At sea, um, Saudi shearwaters have been affected by um, trawl fisheries in the past, um, and the fishing industry, to its credit, is working hard to try and mitigate fisheries impacts. So in the New Zealand EZ, there's a really good um, agreement with local fishermen to try and protect seabirds from being caught. Although, you know, birds are still being caught, but there's effort really being put into protecting them. However, in the open ocean, it's pretty much a different story. There's whole nations out there who fish, and there's no safeguards, you know. They, it comes down to individuals, boat skippers and their crew, as to whether or not they believe seabirds are worth protecting. And if they don't, they can set lines in ways that will kill large numbers of seabirds, probably Tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of birds have been caught um, right across the world in fisheries bycatch. The seabirds are really vulnerable to introduce predators. The chick is left a day, at a day old in the burrow all by itself. So it's a tiny little fluffy thing sitting there in the nest and the adults are out at sea getting food. And you know, it's totally safe in here from uh, hawks and skua gulls and blackback gulls. But for a rat that gets onto this island, it goes into a burrow and finds this little chick sitting there and it just sees an easy meal. Dock and other agencies in New Zealand have been really good at clearing islands of pests, which is allowing seabirds to start recovering on those islands. I wish one day soon mainland New Zealand could be like Rangatira Island. Predator free. <laughs>